Everybody. Um, so my name is Richard Lex Miracle, and um, I was uh, invited some months ago to come and run a process of uh, developing some guidelines for the restoration of succulent thicket, and uh, with the intention of trying to bring together a fairly opinionated and diversely opinionated uh, group of scientists, practitioners, farmers, and and try to make sense of it all, um, and so I've gone through a process of uh, uh, evaluating the, what's in the published literature, all the theses, there's a great number of theses, a lot of theses, and uh, <laughs> a huge amount of research has actually gone into Thicket, and what I want to talk about today, which really pertains to the, the, the carbon day that, uh, that is the focus of today, is around the uh, site suitability and, and selecting at a site level, I'm not talking about selecting whole farms, I'm, I'm really sort of focusing within a site. Uh, if you are, if your goal is carbon uh, sequestration, and that's, what, if that's your primary goal uh, in, in a restoration project, what are the governing factors that would dictate how you, where you would do your work, where you would do it best? Um, and it does, I mean, I think it would be helpful for farmers here today, maybe you, to look at your land, to help you to think about different portions of your land, or if you are somebody here uh, interested in, in selecting or, or evaluating land for a, uh, uh, that your, your business is carbon uh, credit trading, then, then maybe this, there'd be something in you for you, for you to do. So, um, so we, we, we know that we've got this so-called miracle plant to spec worm, which is this, this amazingly uh, effective plant at working in extremely difficult environments to sequester carbon and uh, it, it is really good at what it does. Uh, I don't know, um, I, I, in, in all of my reading on it and, and thinking about it, one would be hard pressed to engineer something actually that, that is effective, as, as that is, would be more effective than, than spec form and what it does. But it, it's not without concerns, um, they really, uh, in the scientific community and, and in some of the uh, controversy that maybe has emerged around spec worm is, is that not all of thickets, of course, is dominated or was dominated by spec worm. In other words, if one looks at a, a map like this, which is color coded where the, the purple is, is where one would historically have expected to find uh, spec worm to be dominant. Um, the, uh, sorry, this is where, where it currently is mapped as dominant. The blue would be historically where you would expect to have found it, uh, where it's been maybe de been degraded. And the black blobs are, are where it, in a mosaic form, you would expect it to be dominant in clumps as opposed to sort of really continuous color. And then that table on the left would just show you uh, something of the, veg the vegetation types that are, are considered where, where you would expect to find a spec worm dominant. So the reality is there's large tracts of the biome that are where, where spec worm historically is not uh, dominant. And that has led um, scientists and conservationists and uh, people in environmental affairs and other, play, uh, other, and, and other sectors, I can put it like that, to start to raise some red flags around this. Because uh, one of the concerns is when you get a, a, a very dense stand of spec worm, that you, you could displace uh, smaller plant guilds and species, particularly if you are in, uh, going into the succulent karoo or nama karoo where, where stature is not impressive, uh, but conservation uh, value is high. And uh, a, a, a large stand of spec worm probably would outshade or outcompete uh, uh, some of these smaller species. So that's a, a, one of some of the concerns. I'm, I'm really just raising the concerns as as they've been expressed to me. Uh, also, if you if you have a, a naturally open ecosystem, like one would expect in the Nama Karoo, uh, into in these mosaics into the succulent or Nama Karoo, or even into Feinbos or Nostafelt, uh, you, you would expect um, uh, eco, an, a, a, a series of, how do I put it, the, an ecological dynamic that is associated with openness. And by planting <coughs> dense speckworm into that, you start to alter the, the dynamics of reproduction and, 
and natural uh, nutrient movements and soil movement and things like that, which which are, are part of those systems. They're integral to those systems. So <coughs> those were just some of the uh, some of the concerns. I'm sure there, there are others more more specific to that. I think for me the very black and white uh, point out of this is that across the the interest groups of um, restoration, whether you're a conservationist, a scientist, a spec worm uh, farmer, a carbon sequestrator, any level of disunity and con uh, controversy in this really will be unhelpful. It doesn't actually help anybody to, to fight about these, these things. And hence the guidelines. That, that's why we, that was the original motivation for the guidelines. And particularly, I think, for the carbon <coughs> market, where there's such a high need for integrity of science and a, an incredible, a, a very high need for verifiable information that can be passed on to people who are paying for the carbon credits, it's, it's essential that we actually try and find mechanisms to step away from controversy and contention. Uh, it would be just very unhelpful if, if uh, carbon is being, tr I'm using as a scenario now, uh, carbon is being traded and, and uh, credits are being <coughs> assigned to thicket restoration based on spec worm planting and then a body of um, uh, individuals, wh wherever they come from, were to start making very public statements against that would obviously undermine my... So that would be an example, I think, of, of that. And um, I think the bottom line is that... Uh, not all spec worm planting is restoration. Uh, in other words, there are scenarios, real scenarios, where dense planting of spec worm actually falls outside the realm of restoration. For me, I, I think a lot. I think the majority of cases of, of where spec worm can be used, uh, densely planted spec worm, um, does contribute to restoration. But there's certainly some examples where it doesn't, and we want to know where those are. Because I think one of the key solutions to uh, trying to uh, remove controversy from this whole thing, while in some ways the science builds up a, a strong argument, is going to be site selection. Um, so if your, if your goal is to plant spec worm for, uh, to achieving a, a very high cover or complete cover, and you've got, uh, and maybe that's motivated by the uh, carbon sequestration funding, uh, site selection is going to be really helpful in, in this process. So, um, and I think the the key is is going to be detailed mapping. If I can make one very strong case that I've seen out of all of my uh, thinking and reading of the the research and, and talking to people at that, uh, like at that workshop we had a, a few months ago, where we, we a lot of this was started is that a foundational investment in, a, in any project is going to be is detailed mapping uh, where, where you, I mean it's, it's, a, it's a process of investment where money is spent to obtain maps and understanding of the land that is finer than the existing broad scale data sets that are available is going to be in my mind the key to um, uh, stepping outside of controversy and uh, Actually, and more than that, actually getting optimal, uh, and optimal growth of that spectrum. Um, so in my mind, this is looking at very detailed biophysical mapping, understanding uh, the slope, uh, slope position, slope angle, aspect, things like that. Detailed, uh, I'm not talking about detailed soil mapping like you would in an arable field, but having a good understanding of where, of how the geology and soils change on the, across a farm or a portion of a farm. I think very significantly is going to be the detailed mapping of existing vegetation. Um, using that existing in, that, that information on existing vegetation to build a picture of what historically was likely to have been there, what types of thicket were likely to be there. Um, being able to make a definitive uh, statement as to whether or not spec worm was a dominant plant on that landscape. And um, you'll see... Uh, to me, that's not a, a, a prerequisite. Uh, it's just part of the decision-making process. And, and so uh, my first sort of major point is that, that uh, it's sometimes tempting. Somebody who, I do a lot of mapping. I, I, I enjoy maps and GIS and all the rest of it. 
it's sometimes te sometimes tempting to to stick with the easily available data sets that we have because we do have we do have quite good data sets the existing MBA veg map and geological maps and things like that the, the problem is they they at quite a broad scale and uh, I think uh, we we must never shy away from investing and I use that word deliberately in detailed mapping on a, on a farm as a, as a prerequisite uh, for this. <coughs> because at the end of the day, I think the core controversial argument lies against dense spectrum planting lies with existing biodiversity. So there is there are risks here if you plant densely across a landscape without uh, taking into account what's already there on the ground, you can you can. Uh, stand on, fed over, plant over all these uh, s small and quite conservation significant uh, species, which, uh, and that's, if there's one thing that I think will attract the uh, uh, unhelpful controversy is, is this type of uh, planting. So you have to know where these, where these uh, biodiversity hotspots, if I can use that sort of phrase, uh, are. Um, <coughs> To me, this is not. This doesn't require specialist knowledge in the sense of you have to employ an expensive specialist to come on site, but it does require somebody, I think, walking the length and breadth of a farm. I mean, if you if you are the farmer, you probably already know where these are. But if you if you're coming <coughs> onto a landscape, like if I was going onto that landscape, I'm not a dwarf succulent specialist. I'll, I will remember when I started working in the Cedarburg for my masters. Then come from the grasslands of KZN. I was utterly traumatized by the diversity. Uh, I mean, I, it was just an overwhelming number of species in every square meter, and, and they all looked totally different to me. Um, but I trained myself very quickly, uh, not necessarily to get to a species level, but I could separate out species to the point that I could uh, identify areas of high diversity. And, th and that's really what is needed. You can take photographic evidence to back up a uh, a story, uh, an account, but the point of it is you want to know where there are pockets, and that they generally are pockets of diversity, high diversity, often associated with, uh, with natural refugia. So these landscapes have been subject, I must be very really careful, I've got your hand in the room, they've been subject to livestock grazing and browsing, <laughs> badly managed, however it was, okay, whoever we, we're putting the blame on. But the point is for, for literally hundreds, you know, 150, 160 years, livestock have accessed this land um, and have had an impact on, on the diversity. And so where there's remnant diversity, it's often easily identified by like, where can animals not easily get to? Rocky, very steep rocky slopes and, and uh, uh, places where far from water or something like that. So the point of it is with a little bit of thinking, you can often uh, work out where to go and look and, and get a good good example of a good, good understanding of this, and and map it, GPS it, however you do it. It's not it's, there's lots of easy free tools to do this. I think you want to avoid areas where there is uh, a high diversity of other thicket species. Um, they're generally telling you that it's not badly degraded, and and again you don't want to um, you know there, there's you don't, you don't want to change the ecology of an existing thicket situation by um, dominating it with spectrum necessarily. And I, I think this is now, I'm, I'm heading into my opinion quite strongly here. Where, where there are mosaics with thickets, between thicket and another vegetation type, like yeah. succulent karoo, nama karoo, grassland or, or whatever it might be, um, these sort of fringe areas, it's often quite hard to separate out what is degra degraded thicket and what is just a naturally open ecosystem, unless you're quite skilled in the, in the understanding and interpretation of vegetation. Um, so where possible, if you're trying to avoid controversy, would be to identify these sort of landscapes, these mosaic landscapes, and I would put them as a... a a much later in the process uh, planting area. In other words, they would be lower in the priority until I've had time to investigate properly. Are we dealing with degraded thicket or are we dealing with an open mosaic of thicket, a naturally open mosaic of thicket? Because again, th these are the areas of, of controversy. Um, I think it was Gail who mentioned you don't want to plant thicket into uh, uh, 
frosty yeah. areas. So that's just a practical one. I, I would look at Robert uh, Becker's work on uh, on frost pooling, cold frost, cold, what is it? Oh, the cold, cold air pooling. <laughs> that one, sorry. <laughs> and frost areas. And uh, you just definitely want to stay away from those. Uh, that's just a very practical one. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, and then, you know, th this might sound that I'm really trying to restrict where one can work, but actually there's a lot of areas where one can still work and you can operate with great confidence in these areas. I think anywhere where you're getting a situation like this where there's a clear fence line contrast, clear remnant patches of, of thicket going into uh, uh, maybe even a lowland area, situations like this where you can, you know, there's a dense remnant patch of, thi of not thicket, of, of speckworm, Clearly, these landscapes were dominated by spectrum. So in a situation like this, in my mind, there, there can be no controversy. These are landscapes that would have historically had very, very high levels of, of spectrum. Situations like this, which one could call these, these pseudo-savannas, where um, ignoring just the French line contrast, which again is a giveaway, but these sort of open grassland situations where you've got uh, remnant canopy trees, and I think very significantly uh, that these canopy trees are showing signs of obvious stress, even to the point of death. So where you're getting a lot of these, <coughs> these trees here, the grade ones are, are dead ones. Very clearly, these are, are remnant trees. And they, the fact that they're under stress tells you that that ecosystem wasn't always like that. It's changed over the years. And uh, that, to me, would be a classic case where you'd be confident to go in to, to, to go with high density planting spectrum because th uh, that is a, a damaged situation. And then I think another one would be where irrespective of the history of vegetation on the site, doesn't matter what was there, I think there are states of degradation where you've crossed certain thresholds where you, you can no longer recognize the original vegetation. It's almost irrelevant what was there at that point because it is so damaged. And it's often evidenced by what is happening in the soil where you're getting, if you're looking from the air, uh, clearly it looks like a cat's been sharpening its claws on this landscape and, and, and a huge amount of soil is being is mobile at this point. It's, it's a, so degraded that... Uh, I think anything, I, I, I would agree with you, Hannah, on this one, getting some vegetation cover, <coughs> anything there is a step in the right direction. And it, it's an academic argument at that point as to w whether you're restoring towards the original vegetation X or Y is almost irrelevant. Again, it's often at a finer scale, it's evidenced by the exposure of rockiness as the so topsoil has gone, exposed root. Uh, tree roots, things like that, where you can see you've lost the top 10 or 15 centimeters of soil. Um, I would say, in my professional opinion, that th this landscape would do well. It would be a massive improvement if we could get spectrum uh, to plant it there, densely planted spectrum. Where, if you are in an area where, in your opinion, it would be inappropriate to go to dense to planting of spectrum, it doesn't necessarily mean your option is or zero. I think there are other options. So wh where this might not be the right picture for this slide because I'm not sure what was here, but where you get a pattern, where you, where you plant in patterns of spectrum, in other words, you try to emulate a clumpiness, leaving some uh, space in between for other plants to exist. If they were there, this looks like quite a degraded site, but I couldn't find another picture uh, in, in, in my uh, library where I had sort of clumpy planting of spectrum uh, with other other species. But if you imagine this as having some dwarf succulents uh, around in it or other uh, plant guilds around there, then you've created space for both. That's the eroded area in the Tonga system in Kambu. Is, is that where you recognize it as such? Okay. So this may be one would even have gone to 100% plant. That was planted in roads, um, Okay. The point is that you, you, you don't use a grid pattern in, in some circumstances like this. You, you would uh, deliberately leave space. 
where, where you've got a situation maybe uh, in, in a mosaic area or there's remnant vegetation that you're trying to protect, you would like to protect, I think planting again in a, in a manner that rebuilds the structure of the clumpy, the, the, the bush clump structure of speckworm felt, where you have a canopy tree with a dense skirting of speckworm, um, one, one could aim to do that. So I understand there's some economic implications to the, these last two slides um, because it's uh, inefficient from a planting point of view. Um, but <coughs> part of what I've been trying to articulate is this uh, desire to, to have a, an industry that is um, free, relatively free of controversy, if I can put it like that. Um, and so if I can to land this thing um, we, we as this uh, industry emerges as this uh, body of restoration practitioners uh, and this momentum in, in spectrum based restoration uh, gathers itself which it's clearly doing I think um, within a farm uh, within a farm uh, scale uh, very accurate positioning and defendable positioning of dense planting of speckworm. Um, certainly in the first few years of a project, uh, and, and while the sector in a sense gathers reputation and the science gathers uh, more evidence to support or, or, or uh, even contradict um, or, or what we do to, so we get the scientific backing for what we're doing. Um, I think there's enough space on the landscape, even let's say within any one farm, where there's work for a lot of years, which is not controversial. And so I suppose my uh, suggestion to, to the community is to invest in the fine scale mapping, start, and then start on those areas where there is the least risk of being, uh, attracting the ire of uh, some environmental department or uh, the accusation that Speckworm planting, uh, speckworm farming at the risk of conservation. I think there's enough space in the landscape to do that, and it really boils down to judicious and detailed site planning. Thank you. Thank you.